So, um, so today I am actually recording this video um, just to kind of, I don't know, just to kind of say how I feel about just a whole bunch of, you know, things that are going on and, um, and probably even because I've been having a, a lot of conversations with people over the past few months, you know, about my desire to wrestle and my desire to be a part of wrestling and my desire to, you know, have wrestling a part of Jamaica. Look, I left Jamaica when I was 15 years old. I grew up in the country. I lived there until I was 11 years old. My mom, um, my mom had to leave, you know, when I was about three months old and she went to Canada and so she left myself and my brothers with my grandmother and that's that's how we grew up and you know it was it was pretty tough because my grandmother worked and she provided for us as best as she could while my mom you know went away and and, and put herself together and tried to get things ready for us um i remember moving to kingston and i remember being so excited about moving to kingston because it was it was it was such a big deal um living in Trelawney, in the country, my brothers and I would run up and down in, in, in the bush and, you know, uh, we went to school barefooted. Uh, it was just like, it was a fun situation, but at the same time, we always desired more. So moving to Kingston was, was kind of like moving to the big times, if you will. And, and when I moved to Kingston, we moved to this place called Stadium Gardens and um, life just got really different because we moved into a house that was built for a family of four. And there was like 14 of us in that house. And so you can't imagine how tough things were. The men in the house were myself, uh, my brothers, and my cousins. But if you can imagine, in, in my room, on the same bed that I slept on, was uh, my two brothers, um, two cousins, uh, two, two younger cousins, and then also two older cousins. So there was pretty much seven of us that slept um, on that one double bed. Uh, I had all kinds of issues um, growing up as a kid. I had zero confidence. You know, I, 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 I wet the bed or I peed the bed for a very long time. And now when I look back at it, it's just like uh, I was always trying to find my way, just trying to find something, you know. Um, I was always, you know, people got mad at me for doing it. Uh, I remember one day I sat and um, I literally... I tried everything. I literally uh, was going to take a piece of cord and, and tie my penis just because I didn't want to be disappointing anyone because I wet the bed again. And there's nothing. I. <laughs> it was just a really it's unbelievable situation. Uh, but that continued for a while. So there's the confidence just wasn't there where that was concerned. I remember also um, my teeth, like just the whole upper row of my teeth. Um, they said that because my mom left as early as she did, I lacked calcium, and so all the in the enamel, the enamel, or whatever the the the, the, the top layer of my teeth, I uh, all chipped off. So even though I had good bones underneath, the the top layers chipped off, and everything I ate just got stuck to it. You know, so they just looked really really bad, and and so as a result of that, I was scorned, and I mean, there's all kind of different things that went on with that. Um, I was always trying to get into people's good books, you know what I mean? Just trying to do the best that I can to always just live up to people's expectations or to try to do things to make people like me and so on and so forth. At the time, um, again, I tried everything to, to try to fix that teeth situation. I remember, you know, thinking that if I use kerosene oil or if I use gas or if I use the, the, the Ajax that you'd use to clean the bathtub and all that kind of stuff. If I use that stuff on my teeth, then maybe that would make the difference. And it just didn't. So I, I never smiled. Um, every time I see it, I was like, I was kind of like this because I was just so ashamed of, of just how it is, you know, that my teeth looked. And I can't tell the amount of times that I heard that I was ugly and I heard that I was stupid and I heard that I, I, I can't tell you about the times. I lived in a community where no, I mean, a lot of the people in the community, they didn't even know my name. You know, um, they called us, myself and my, 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 my cousins and my brothers, we were known as the Lot 40 boys because we were from Lot number 40. You know, they didn't know our names. In the community, we were the, the, gof, the, go, the gophers. Um, we, you know, went to the shop for people, cut people's lawns and so on and so forth. At, at, at about age 11, 
um, shortly after moving to Kingston, we had to stop going to school. And we stopped going to school because simply our parents just, um, they, our folks couldn't afford to send us to school anymore. In our house, nobody worked. And so my mom and my aunt, whenever it is that money was sent, you know, from abroad, it's whatever, it, it, it just stretched, it, it didn't stretch very far. I remember my cousin Loxley, his dad used to send money and he used to work at Cremo, which is an ice cream place. And so every Friday, um, a little money would come in and also a tub of ice cream. We had no electricity, so that stuff had to be eaten pretty much the same day that it, was, that it came in. And we always ate, um, I think we ate pretty decent on, 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 on Friday and Saturday and um, maybe Saturday and Sunday kind of vibration. But the rest of the time, it was just a hustle. You know, um, I actually didn't know what it was like to eat, you know, uh, a real chicken meal or a fish meal or any of those kind of things or, you know, just a real meal with meat. Um, we were just used to eating chicken back and whatever it was, it was just a struggle and quarter bread and butter and sky juice and those are the kind of things. And every day it was just a hustle, man, getting up in the morning and just hitting the streets and cutting people's lawns and washing people's cars and 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 after that you know um the struggling i i i found there was this guy um that lived in my community that sold newspapers and i started to work for him selling newspapers on the corner of oxford road and old old hope road and um that was kind of how i made my money and when i was done selling newspapers i just went and begged begged for money on the on the side on the streets you know, asking people for money. I, and it was crazy how it is that people treated us. Our people treated me, you know, being on the road and, and, and begging for money and stuff. And people sometimes got angry and they shouted at you because you came close to their cars and people would spit at you and all kind of different things. At age 11, I was, I was just hustling. Um, so I worked in a garage for a while um, until I was about 13. Then when I was 13, Mr. Nugent and Miss Marlene um, took me in in a sense I, and, and, and helped out a lot in terms of Mr. Nugent allowed me to work with him on his truck. He used to drive truck for Texaco and deliver gas across the island. And so I would get up in the morning at like six o'clock in the morning and, 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 and run down to his house and catch a ride with him. And, um, and, and all day. And sometimes I get home at 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night. And that was cool to me because I, I always seem to get into trouble when I was at home. I always seem to get into trouble with all kinds of stuff. I just never, I, I, it's always like I couldn't do anything right, you know. And um, so I worked with him for a while. And then when, when the guy that worked with him, his original guy came back after, after his sick leave, Jonathan, I mean, I, um, he, Mr. Gray, Mr. C, uh, as we call him, introduced me to this other guy, Brown Man. And I worked with Brown Man right up until we got word um, that my mom, I'd gotten our stuff ready and it was time for us to go to Canada. Uh, going to Canada was, again, it was the same thing. I thought, you know, this was my opportunity now just to do something different and just to get myself in order. And when I went to Canada and I started going into my classes, I went to, I went to this particular class and it was, they put us, it, I, I got put back in basic, the basic level because I was 15 years old. I hadn't been in school for four years, like zero school. And I'm just, you know, just used to being on the streets and growing up tough and just having to struggle and to fight for everything and, and having to be my own man in so many different ways. So when I was hanging out with these other 15 year olds and, and 14 year olds, and I just felt like they were kids and I felt like a grown man in comparison to them. So I didn't feel comfortable with that. So I started hanging around with a different group of kids. I started hanging around with the kids, um, the Jamaican kids that were in the school, and I started hanging around with the so-called bad kids because I wanted to be around them and I wanted to have what they have. You know, my mom couldn't afford certain things at that point. So we used to shop all the time at this place called Byway. And Byway, um, it was just like a really cheap store. And all my friends were wearing the brand name. Back then it was, you know, it was around DMC time. So Adidas, everything was in. And tracksuits were big at that time. And, and certain kind of jeans and all that kind of stuff. And we just couldn't afford that. So I started hanging around with these guys that I thought were coolest. Um, gold was big back then. The big old gold chain and lots of them. I remember this guy, Billy Rumbaki. A white guy that was, uh, it was like a hip-hop guy. And, and he had all of the stuff and all of these guys. So anyhow, we started. I started hanging around with these guys and I started to get myself into trouble because I could not afford the things that they had. 
So and and I didn't look the way that they looked, and of course at that point I still my teeth still looked the same way. So the girls didn't look at me, and 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 I just didn't have the confidence in myself, you know, to feel like I I I could measure up in many ways. So I got myself in a lot of trouble, and I remember the day. I remember specifically I was in an auto mechanic class, and there was a volleyball game going on at the gym. And I snuck out of my class, went down to the gym, and just caused a whole heap of trouble. The team that came to play in my school, they weren't very good. And I thought it was my place to tell them what they were doing wrong. And so I, I shouted at them. I said nasty things. And the coach from my school, he came over. And he, um, he said, Kevin, what are you doing here? And I told him that I didn't have a class and he didn't believe me. And so he couldn't have afford to argue with me anymore because he had to go back to coaching. And he went back to the other side to coach. And... You know, I still kept on doing what I was doing. And then he pointed at me and I just felt that he was serious now. And I got up and I, I went back to my class. The moment I got into my class, you know, he came in behind me and told my teacher what was going on. And they decided to suspend me for, uh, for a few... They decided to suspend, give me detentions for a few days for sneaking out of the class. And I thought that this guy had no right. And I, I was just so angry, you know. And I was angry for a lot of reasons. I was angry for a whole bunch of reasons. And one of the reasons why I was angry is that because I felt like now I was assigned to get some, con some traction in terms of being somebody in the school. You know, I had a bad reputation in the sense. And when I went, I was the loudest one in the gym. Whenever something was going on, I was always the one just trying to just fit in and trying to make people see me kind of thing. So when he decided I was going to get those detentions, these, after school is when I hang out with my friends and we go do whatever it is that we do. So I decided I was going to just use the opportunity to just kind of teach a teacher a lesson. And Mr. O'Hare was his name. And I remember, I remember that day that Mr. O'Hare came out of the office and he started to just um, walk towards me. And I had told everybody that I was going to do something that, that evening. So there's a huge crowd gathered. <sighs> I went up to him, you know, I stood face to face with him, almost nose to nose with him. And I told him perhaps the nastiest things that I could imagine. I called him every name that I could imagine. And I remember him just pretty much saying to me that, Kevin, calm down, you're going to regret this. Kevin, calm down, you're going to regret this. And after that happened, it was a Friday, so I ran out of the school and I went home. And on Monday when I went back to school, I heard my name on the announcements Kevin Wall into the office, please. And I went down to the office and the principal came out and he said, I heard about what you did in school on Friday. And, um, and so the bottom line is I got suspended for four days. I went home and um, my mom wasn't home that day. She's never home during the day because my mom worked really hard. She always worked like two jobs, three jobs. I remember my mom leaving the house early every morning and coming home late every night. So she was never home during the days. And um, she was always home to make dinner for us, though. She was always home to, to help, to, to just do whatever it is that she had to do to kind of play her role. And she always had lunch money for us. It was five of us. I mean, it was just really, really tough on her now looking back at it. But um, when she came home that day and she saw me at home and she asked me why I was home and I told her I was suspended. And then she started to talk to me about just the whole deal of coming from Jamaica and the struggles that we had and all that kind of stuff. And school was important. And here it was that I had the opportunity to do just that and this is how I was using it. So I was I was disappointed in myself at that point because regardless of what was going on, I always had this incredible love for my mom. I never had I always understood why it is that she left. I always understood that, you know, she had to go seek better opportunities, not just for herself, but for all her kids as well. And um and so I just didn't want to disappoint her. With even all the bad stuff that I was doing, I never wanted to disappoint her. I was never, ever, ever once in my life rude to my mom because I've always respected her for all the different things that she brought. And so seeing her that angry that day, it was, it was the kicker for me, man. It changed everything. And so when I went back to school and I met Jonathan Graham and I started wrestling, that's when my life began to change. So to cut a long story short, I started wrestling and I wrestled and wrestling kept me in school long enough. So I graduated from grade 12. And after that, again, I went into a depressing state because the only job that I could get with a grade 12 diploma was just the jobs working in warehouse and dishwashing in, in restaurants and all that kind of stuff. And I hated it with a passion. And so I got depressed and I stuck in my mom's basement for 
I don't know, however long, and I didn't work, I didn't contribute, I didn't, I wasn't able to do anything, and I just didn't feel, I can't even explain how, how it felt. There were times when I didn't want to see my mom, like I just waited in my room, and when she left, that's when I came out, and I left the house, and when she, when I knew that she was in bed, that's when I came home, you know. And then, you know, I started coaching wrestling again at a high school, a local high school, um, and and just you know how it is that the kids responded to me and the wrestling everybody you know in the school all the teachers were telling me that i should go to university and become a teacher i sat and i spoke with jonathan about it you know um and he said um so what do you want to do and i said <laughs> at that point in time at that point in time i guess i just wanted something different you know, and um, I told him that I was going to go to university and these were the schools that, you know, I, you know, I had applied to. And even the whole application process was just another journey because I never filled, I never did anything. The people at the school that I was coaching at, the principal pulled me into his office one day and he and two counselors were in there and they had all these forms filled out and everything was done for me and they sent off these forms. So by the time I went and sat with Jonathan, Mr. Graham, my coach, um, I had already been accepted in these three universities, not because of my grades, but because I was 21 years old and I was a mature student, so they accepted me based on that. And um, I ended up going to Lakehead University because it was the, the one that was furthest away. At that point in time, I was just getting myself in, again, in a lot of situations because a lot of the friends that I had, you know, they were into drugs and they were into all kind of things. At that point in time, in, in the 80s, uh, late eighties, crack cocaine, um, was just kind of coming in and it was fast money and quick money. And all of these guys were getting involved with it and they were all my friends. And so even though I didn't get, um, get, I didn't quite get involved with it. My, I, I was around these guys that were doing it, you know? So Mr. Graham's suggestion to me was just go to the school that was furthest away. And that was Lakehead University. And I remember walking into Lakehead University and sitting in the, um, the forum, the Agora, um, and feeling that day that I had a chance to do something different. And because I never, you know, really took to school, I just, I felt, I, I still couldn't read very well, you know. And university was just tough. It was just really tough for me, in, especially in the early goings. But wrestling, wrestling kept me there, you know. And so I, I say all of what I'm saying right now to the, say that wrestling for me meant everything. It changed my life and it gave me a path. It gave me vision. It gave me a whole heap of stuff. And I was on teams with guys that, you know, they were doing different things and they were my buddies. And, you know, we were, we just became really, really close friends and I trained hard and I felt like I belonged. And so throughout my entire life, the one thing that I felt good about, the one thing that I felt confident about, the one thing that gave me any kind of real purpose in my life, you know, was wrestling. And I, and I could always fall back on wrestling. After I finished university, I traveled around. I, I traveled around for a little while, you know, um, just bouncing around. I taught high school for a bit, you know, then I went out to Winnipeg, then I went to Saskatoon, then I went to Regina. Um, I just moved around for a little while and then my brothers uh, came up with the idea that, you know, my brother, you know, wanted to open to start business. And I think that was the shift. You know, we came back to Jamaica and um, looked around and, and then before long, well, they came back to Jamaica. We, at first we drove around Canada for a little bit thinking that we could find the opportunities there, but it didn't happen. So they came back to Jamaica and um, realized that computer and the internet and all that kind of stuff it just wasn't here at the time and so decided that that is what you know they wanted to get into and of course you know as brothers you know they included me in that process and so I uh, came back to Jamaica started working in the computer store doing all that kind of stuff but as being here I just I just really want to do something to give back every day that I drove home we had to drive past these kids on the streets, wiping car glass and all that kind of stuff. And I watched the way that people treated them and I watched the way in which they were handled. And I couldn't help but realize that that's where I'm coming from too. And so I want to do something different. And so I did a lot of work in the prisons. You know, I started to, um, to go to the prisons because of my friend Hurricane Carter, you know, and the life that he had, you know, just how it is that he spent years in prison for crimes he didn't commit. And then I started to look back at my life and I realized that if I did not leave Jamaica where I did, 
you know, or if I did not find wrestling what I did, I would certainly be in the same boat, you know what I mean? I would be in prison, I would be dead, I would be something, but I just wouldn't be, I wouldn't have been where I found myself at the point. And so I really wanted to make a difference. And so that is how wrestling started. Now, I'm wearing this t-shirt. This is a t-shirt that I got when I first went to Lakehead. And this t-shirt is about this guy, Gord Garvey. It's the Gord Garvey Memorial. And I, when I went there, I just, I kept hearing all these stories about Gord Garvey, how hard he worked and the fact that he had Lou Gehrig's disease. And, you know, he was just looked upon and looked up to or whatever. So I just realized that there was just a strong legacy, you know, with wrestling and my coach Francis Clayton, just the kind of things that he's been through and how it is that he came through. And he was just like a tough kid a troublesome kid but at the same time here it is that he was the coach at um at the university so i wrestled and so when i'm i'm here back in jamaica right now and i'm looking around and i'm looking at everything that's going on and i'm looking at all these kids you know that a lot of these kids they will not get the opportunity to even do to finish high school some of them de definitely not go to university or to college because things are just tough the economy here is tough, um, the situations are tough, and, and so for me, to be able to come back here and be a part of wrestling, and to bring wrestling here, it means everything. Now, we're in a country where people don't understand wrestling. People don't understand it, they think that it's the WWE, people jumping off of top ropes, hitting people with chairs, and all that kind of stuff, you know? And so in order for them to get a good understanding of it, there has to be an example, there has to be examples of it, and, and so I started training again. And so I went to Australia a couple of years ago and I participated in, in, in um, the Commonwealth Wrestling Championships as well as the, um, the Australia Cup. And I, I felt the vibe again. You know, my body felt good. I'm, I was 41 years old at the time. I'm 43 years old now. And just looking at all of this stuff and looking at, you know, how it is that um, that all panned out and how helpful the wrestling community was in terms of jumping on board to do whatever it is. Joseph Marcosa, the chairman of the Commonwealth Wrestling Federation, all the things that he was willing to do to get Jamaica, you know, on the map, including paying my 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 plane fare, you know, to go to Australia and 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 fight, you know, and um, and so here it is that I am now, you know, getting ready for the the 2013 Commonwealth Wrestling Championships which will be held in South Africa. And my vibe is I just want people to be able to see the sport and to understand the transformative powers of the sport. And so therefore, we'll be able to offer the sport to all the kids here in Jamaica. You don't have to be the fast kid. You don't have to be the strong kid. You don't have to be, you know, special in any kind of way. All you have to do is show up into the room and just keep showing up. And guaranteed, you will learn something that would make your life better. And so Jamaica wrestling for me is so much more than just um, having kids as come to a wrestling club. I'm, I see it as having kids have, get the opportunity to do something with themselves. And so the scholarship opportunities that will give them the chance to, you know, to go to university, to go to college, to just even finish high school, to get a better sense of themselves and to learn the discipline, to learn what it takes to be a success. That's kind of what it's all about for me. So Jamaica wrestling is, um, we're definitely on the move. And, and, and I'm asking every single person, everyone that has wrestled, everyone that, that has had that touch from wrestling, that transformative power that wrestling brings, I'm saying to all of us, just let's get together. Let's get together and make Jamaica wrestling a reality. As a wrestler, you know, people say all kind of different things, man. But I know, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt with every fiber of my being, I know that once, if, if, if you can get a kid to wrestle for three years, if you can get a kid to wrestle for four years, you have a different person at the end of that pipeline, you know? And so wrestling is, is what I'm all about right now. You know, I have, I have put a lot of things on hold. I have put a lot of things, you know, um, aside right now just to make sure that I build, you know, I, I, build, it, I build this federation. You know, Coach Wayne Smythe, as he's down here on the island right now, and he believes in it the same way that I do. Rick Henry, um, who, you know, he's from Canada as well, but he now he's now in Texas. He understands the vibration as well. So what we have going for us right now is that there's a bunch of guys that have benefited tremendously from the sport of wrestling. 2.5 million people in Jamaica. 
Most of the crimes that are happening in Jamaica right now, it's our boys, it's our kids, it's the disenfranchised, the youth, them that don't know what to do with themselves, they don't have nowhere to go. When you take a look at the opportunities that are out there, there are opportunities that are out there, but they're not out there for them because they're not prepared for it. Uneducated, don't have the kind of structure, don't have the kind of confidence in themselves to know that there's other ways that they can express themselves. So it's... it's It's, it's very important, it's extremely important that we do what it is that we need to do right now. So I'm asking, again, um, just join us. Just join us. We could use money, we could use mats, we could use all kind of different things. But personally right now as I look at it, here it is that I'm getting ready to go to South Africa. I need money for my plane ticket, I need to be able to stay in a hotel, I need... Um, gear, um, all of these different kind of things. And so, yeah, it might look like, oh, it's Kevin Wallen, this one guy going to represent Jamaica in Australia. But we, we're setting the tone. If we don't set the tone um, and, and be able to set an example has to, you know, to be able to show kids what wrestling has done, you know, um, in my life, in my coach's life, in, 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 in so many different lives. So all the Jamaicans that are abroad or whatever the case is who have wrestled, we're asking them not just to, you know, to send money or to be a part of it in that way, but we're actually asking them to see how it is that they can physically get involved and help us do what it is that we're doing here. Um, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm babbling a little bit right now, but that's just what it is. That, that's just how it is that I get when it comes to wrestling. It's, it's, been, such, it's been such an amazing journey. You know, and um, and yeah, I just I just really want to ensure that we provide the opportunity just for the kids here to be able to see themselves differently and to be able to do something with their lives that could give them the opportunity to just kind of expand their horizons. You know, and um, and for me, wrestling is, is is the sport to do it. You know, you have track and field, you have soccer, you have netball, you have basketball. There's a lot of sports here on the island. Um, that people are, are participating in but you have to have a particular kind of skill set especially um, to get involved with those sports but with wrestling again just show up and every day that you show up in the room it's an opportunity for you to get better it's an opportunity for you to learn something that would make a difference and and um, after talking to all these guys that I've worked with in the prisons over the years I realized that if they had the opportunities to do something different then maybe they would have done differently, you know, and maybe their lives would have looked differently. And maybe a few more people would have still been alive. And maybe people would have been still be able to go home to their families because again, it's it's a long story. But they say it's not trying to save the world, but just save, you know, just to help an individual find themselves so that they can do whatever it is that they need to do so that they don't become a destruction to the world. And and um that's what it is for me. So join us, Jamaica Wrestling Federation. Um, there's all kind of links. Take a look at our, our Facebook page. There's all kind of ways to get in touch with us. Um, my, my, e per, my email is jam um, at fila-wrestling.com. Um, Kevin D. Wallen at gmail.com. You know, 876-371-4510. That's my phone number. There's all kind of ways. Right now, more than anything else, we need financial support. Um, we need to get mats into these different places that we're trying to get wrestling started. So whatever help it is that you can offer, we're, we're looking for it. But Jamaica Wrestling is, is, is um, I believe that we have an amazing opportunity here to help the kid that otherwise would be overlooked. You know? So again, I, I, I'm so appreciative of the fact that you know, you've taken the time to watch this video and um, I'm hoping that when you turn this thing off, that you'll be able to, you know, to see it fit, you know, to take action. And you don't have to be rich, this or that. We're not looking for you to give thousands and thousands of dollars, you know, a dollar at a time. So if you can give 10, 5, 20, whatever it is that you can give to support the Federation. And, um, and let's make this thing a reality. Thank you so much for listening and blessings.